from the book of Genesis, second chapter, verses 15 through 17, and the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was the most crafty than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was good for the light of the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some up to her husband was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made long claws for themselves. The epistle lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to Romans, chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is law, no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died through one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin, for this judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If, because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The Gospel lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, the first 11 verses. Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The word of the Lord. Baptism, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness. 
He prayed and he fasted for 40 days and nights. And as that time was drawing to a conclusion, Jesus is confronted by Satan. Jesus is confronted by Satan, and Satan poses before him three temptations. Today, I propose that we pause and take a good, long, hard look at the first of these temptations that Jesus faced. Jesus was hungry. Fasting for that period of time is an unbelievable situation for me to try and wrap my mind around. Jesus was starving. Jesus was on the point of collapse. And so as Satan comes to Jesus, <coughs> Satan says, confrontively, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Quite frankly, that was a very reasonable, reasonable thing to say. A reasonable thing to say to someone who's starving, to someone who is in collapse. Obviously, Jesus, you need bread. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Satan always is pretty reasonable, isn't he? But Jesus, even in his weakened state, knows who Satan is. Deep in the purity of his soul, he remembers the many challenges that God's people throughout holy history have had as Satan has come to them with what seems reasonable but is in fact a deadly sin. Jesus knows from his Old Testament how deadly and dangerous it is to listen to a snake in the garden. And Satan is, above all things, a snake. Jesus is paused. Jesus paused. And he collects himself spiritually, and he collects himself theologically, and he responds to this Satan. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We still live in a world that is attractive to us when arguments are made reasonably. But what Jesus is pointing out to to us as he proclaims his truth to Satan is that the world is wrong. The world is wrong when it says the end justifies the means. Jesus' response to Satan is a declaration of the significance and the importance of means, not just ends. When Jesus says, Man relies on the spoken word of God. He's pointing the process. When Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, the product, but by every word that proceeds from the word of God, he's pointing to the process of the word spoken. Jesus, in his weakened state, is actually doing theology about bread. Can you imagine a theology about something as simple as bread? Jesus knows the scripture. He knows the word of God. He knows the dynamic about the need of humankind for bread. Jesus remembers in his 40 days, the 40 days that Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the law, 
And Jesus is guided by that memory. Jesus remembers in his 40 days of, of prayer and fasting. Jesus remembers the 40 years of the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness until they're delivered into the promised land. Jesus remembers that during that 40 years, at one point in that desolate wilderness, the people didn't have anything to eat. And being people, they turned on their leader, Moses. They said to him, have you brought us out here to die? What kind of a leader are you? And Moses said, God will provide. <clears throat> and quail fell out of the sky. And man, which means, what is this? This bread-like stuff appeared every morning on the ground. And God commanded the people through Moses, take just enough bread for the day. And if they try to hoard it, it spoiled immediately. Take just enough and remember that God will provide through God's instruments for you. And Satan is not one of God's instruments. <coughs> At the end of this temptation period, Satan went away, defeated. At the end of this temptation period, angels came and ministered to Jesus, and he was provided for. Even in collapse, even in desperate hunger, Jesus knew that God was in charge and that God would provide for him. Sadly, sometimes this passage is misappropriated in some churches today. Sadly, some churches really don't get the point about God's processes. And instead, they bifurcate the spiritual from the physical. They say, well, God will provide, so we'll stay focused on spiritual things and sing a few more hymns and pray a few more prayers. And we'll ignore the widow or the orphan or the poor or the hungry, or the destitute. That's not at all what Jesus says. And in fact, throughout this word of God spoken over and over and over again, through the testimony of the prophets and through the testimony of the apostles, we are enjoined to be concerned for the widow. We are enjoined to be concerned about the orphan. We are told to visit the prisoner. We are told to provide for the poor. We are told to feed the hungry and extend the love and hospitality of Jesus Christ to all. Do you know why? Because in this season, guess who the angels are? You are angelos. You are the ones who carry the good news of Jesus Christ in word and in deed. It is a custom for many to give up something for Lent. Today, I encourage you to take something up for Lent. To take up that special offering, the one great hour of share. And if I may say so, I want to commend our Board of Deacons for a new ministry in which we are providing meals for hungry people and for people who have just returned from the hospital and for whom it is a labor to prepare a meal, for those who are caught up in grief and for whom it is a labor prepare a meal because we want to show the love of Christ. I call upon us in the name of the Christ who suffered and died to be his angels and show his love in word and in thought.
but by every word that proceeds from the word of God. 